Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We celebrate the beginning of this holy week with our service of Palm Sunday. Uh, for the blessing of the palms and their readings you have in your bulletin, just logistically, it's going to be very simple. We'll bless the palms. We will process into the church following uh, Jackson and uh, get yourselves into the pews. And then at that point, uh, we will finish the last two verses and Will will play. But we'll do a cappella out here and I think we'll get to the end. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We're on the bulletin inside. There you go. Our processional gospel is from Luke in the 19th chapter. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethany and Bethany, at the mount they call Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their garments on the colt. They set Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their garments on the road. And as he was now drawing near at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus. Praise, Praise, Praise you, O Christ. Christ. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. And we share together our prayer of the day. We praise you, O God. And you can join for redeeming the world through our Savior Jesus Christ. Today he entered the holy city of triumph and was proclaimed the Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. Bless these branches and those who carry them. Grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross, so that joined to his death and resurrection, we enter into life with you through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And let us go forth in peace in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. And Jackson, if you'd lead us in, we'll start out here uh, in the first three verses. And we will start with the refrain. And Jackson, you can wait right there. I forgot. I sent you ahead too far. You come around. You can just turn around and watch us. There you go. All glory, Lord, and honor to you, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna sing. You Oh, 
two verses when we're in.
from the prophet Isaiah in the 50th chapter. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he awakens, wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I didn't turn back. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? All of them who wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please turn to Psalm 31. We'll read responsibly by whole verse. Verses 9 through 16. Psalm 31. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. With my life is wasted with grief, and my ears is with sighing. My strength fails me because of affliction, and my bones are consumed. The scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances, and when they see me in the streets, they avoid me. Like and the dead, dead I am come, out of mind, I am as useless as a broken heart. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. But as for me, I have trusted in you, O Lord. I have said, You are my God. My times are my hands. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. From Paul's epistle to the church at Philippi in the second chapter. If then, there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the 
words of my mouth, the meditations upon our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. This uh, day in the church liturgical calendar is marked by two significant events. One is the procession into Jerusalem of Jesus with his disciples, coming forth as an ancient king of Israel might on the foal of a colt, a colt, the foal of an ass. And in that week that follows, we unfold the story of Christ's passion. So we experience the fullness of God's love for humanity in the most unusual way. So my message today, and I, I like to assume that uh, we as Lutherans know our liturgical calendar well, and there are a couple of special services that happen during this week, one being Monday Thursday, a commemoration of the Lord's Supper, but more importantly, the giving of that great commandment, the love of the Lord God and the love of one's neighbor by Jesus. And then the next day, Good Friday, where we commemorate Jesus' sacrifice for your sake and for mine. But often in churches, people jump right from that joyous procession into Jerusalem, right to Easter. And they forget some significant things happened in between. So for me, Easter is not complete without a commemoration of the death of Jesus and his burial and the awaiting of that great day. So today, we're going to give a little bit of the story of that passion for those that might not be able to make it out during the week. So we have a sense of that. And that's not to discourage you from joining us on Thursday and on Friday at 7 o'clock. In reading that passion of Christ, I see some parallels to almost our weekly drama of worship that is found within that story. I was reminded of our church's liturgy. The prelude preparing us for worship could well be Jesus gathering with his twelve as they move from Galilee toward Jerusalem, as they turn from the Mount of Transfiguration and face Jerusalem and do not turn back. Jesus had avoided it somewhat, and he knew that going to Jerusalem would bring an end to his earthly life, and he, like us in human form, wanted to keep that moment of life full and complete. There was work yet to be done. But he anticipated that drama as it would unfold. And those 12, as they approached the city of Jerusalem, did so with great joy. It was a road that they followed of paved with godly intention. Jesus was following the will of his Father to bring a culmination to his teachings and the revelation of the signs and wonders that he had been performing over those three years. That culminated with the fulfilling of God's will for him, yet unrealized and mysterious still to those 12, but not to Jesus. As our liturgy of worship unfolds, it does so with often a hymn of praise and celebration, a song of joy. And so the disciples are sent to the city to get a colt that was tied up. They bring it to Jesus. They sit him upon it. They lead him into the city. They proceeded with branches of palms as if a red carpet is rolled out before him. In riding is the conquering king of Israel, not as the Israeli kings of old would, but in a humble way. The colt, a foal, one upon which kings would have traditionally entered that holy city. He enters with songs of praise and triumph. He is the conquering hero the conquering prophet of God's people, one upon their hopes and their dreams would be laid. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest of heavens. They invoke, as we do, the Kyrie, Lord, and give him praise and honor as he well deserves. There is much ado that will happen in those next few days. This unlikely king approaches the city with his troops, armed only with branches cut from trees. 
They do not brandish swords of conquest, but instead limbs cut from trees and placed before him. His adversaries in that city, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they are perhaps shrinking back in the darkness, just waiting an opportunity to do what their plan was to do. This city and this people, they won't be his. They may be muttered under their breath. They did so waiting for this pretender king to make a mistake. And mistakes he would make to draw attention of many others. He, the conquering king, would, in an unusual way, sack this great city of Jerusalem in its proud temple in a very different way. He would raise up the only weapon he would brandish in this whole week, a string of cords hung together. And he would enter the Gentile court and he would whip the money changers upsetting tables, creating all kinds of ruckus as he felt that they were defiling his father's house, stirring up trouble he did indeed for himself. At the end of each day, he would probably return to a familiar place. He would go up the Mount of Olives to a little city over the top of the hill, a city called Bethany. His friends, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, lived there. They would give him shelter and food. The disciples of the, is those religious in Jerusalem, they still kept a close eye on him, looking for a weak link in his armor. And they finally found it in a man by the name of Judas, treasurer of the group. He grumbled, don't you remember, when Mary wasted a precious ointment that could have fed hundreds of people if it had been sold. It was Mary's gift to give to him to anoint her king for what was yet to come. It would probably have been preserved and used for his burial, but it was used while he was alive. What about the poor master? We could have done so much with him. But the coin, he would add to his purse in yet another way, by betrayal. It was a part of the plan, a plan on the road of God's goodly intention. Helmut Tielek, the great church theologian, wrote, Jesus rose up from the place where the kingdom of the world shimmered before him, where crowns flash and banners rustled, and hosts of enthusiastic people were ready to acclaim him. And he quietly walked the way of poverty and suffering to the cross. Judas was mistaken. Jesus was not a triumphant David standing before his conquered Goliath. He was the dutiful son of the Heavenly Father who had schooled him in the art of giving himself for the sake of others. His gift to the many that followed earlier in that joyous procession was a victory of a different sort. It would be a resounding defeat of the one enemy that we have no power over, and that is death brought on by our sin. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little. Let me return. There would be feasting and proclamation yet that week in Jerusalem, and prayers, an important part of all of our liturgy. The feasting was around bread and wine with his beloved friends. <clears throat> take and eat, take and drink. This is my body, this is my blood, it is broken, it is shed for you. Eat in remembrance of me. He institutes a new Passover out of the old, which had been spoken and celebrated for years. He spoke many words of good news, confusing news to those that would hear a different story on the traditional Passover night. He refined and redefined for them the old story of how God had saved his people, and the new story would be revealed through the sacrifice he would make in the day to come. But that night, he spoke of the saving salvation that comes through death, and the gift of a new life that comes through God's forgiveness of his people. 
that we remember in this precious meal. He preached also of God's love that would take shape in the new commandment I give you, that I have loved you so that you should love one another. Emotions swelled, I'm sure, at his words when he spoke of one who would betray. And then he says to Judas, go now, do what you must do. And Judas departed. He departed for his bag of coins and took his contempt and the hopes that he had of a different sort of Messiah with him. As strange as it may seem, it was all a part of God's intentions along this tragic road that Jesus was traveling that day that would lead to a cross. And he would make some promises to them. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom so that we, you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Ah, that's what we've waited for for three years. Now we get what we deserve for our faithfulness. Yes, there it is. The conquering king confers his bounty upon the warriors and the faithful, but little did they know that he conferred on them, each and every one, a death sentence, as they would go forth to faithfully follow the risen one, who in three days later would be indeed alive. As they did, they would each suffer a martyr's death, but they would receive, as is promised to you and I, the very kingdom of God. Then there was prayer in their liturgy, and as Jesus prayed, so we pray. In that garden called Gethsemane on the side of the Mount of Olives in the dark of night, a day of conquest over death, he prayed, and Judas betrayed. He prayed for understanding of what God was doing in his life. Do we pray? When contemplating the mysteries of life that are upon us, do we draw upon God's strength and guidance and help? Jesus prayed. He prayed intensely while others slept and they could not stay awake as he had bid them. And his prayer was disturbed by the marching of feet and the rattling of swords and the kiss of betrayal upon a cheek by a disciple who flees into the dark shadows as the enemy crept around and took him hostage. The liturgical drama of life and death unfolded. Here was a suitable offering, one God demanded as payment for the gracious gift that would be offered. Jesus is the offering that pays the price of human debt, just as we place coin and bills in a, a plate of offering to our God, the signs of our humble servitude, his servitude would be to the nth degree. His sacrifice was extreme. He gave until it hurt, unlike our token tributes. First, emotional torment, imprisoned in the depths of a hole on the ground, held captive until examined by Ananias, and then taken to those people, drug across the valley of Kidron into the city, city up the steep steps, there to await an inquisition from noble peers, from priestly people, and from Roman rulers. His ears would hear the lies that people told about him, that judgment might be brought forth, false accusations. He was dragged, dragged before the Prince of Israel, noble Herod, one of his own, and then Pilate, a governor of Rome. I see no wrong in this man. He's not my problem. You deal with him. And he goes to Herod again. And once civil, loving crowds that welcome him, they turn bitter. And they turn angry. 
And they cried for the blood of Jesus. And blood they would see as he would be lashed 39 times with cords embedded with pieces of metal and with flesh stripped from his body until almost dead, but not yet. Adding insult to severe injury, they placed a purple robe of royalty on him to mock him, pressed a crown of thorns into his brow, crucify him. And now the road that was paved with palm branches and trees to pave his way into the city was paved and would be with droplets of blood. He, how could this be? God's intention for anyone, anyone at all. Is that not his only son? Where is the love and the mercy and the forgiveness his son had spoken about that the Father would offer to us? Offered maybe for you and me, but apparently not for this precious one. Such an offering was to be him that day for you and for me. Undeserving, he goes forth for you and for me. Our liturgical offertory, it's that tragic dirge that day of a near to dead man stumbling upon pavement stones weighed down by a cross beam upon his shoulders. Martin Luther writes, our suffering is not worthy the name of suffering. When I consider my crosses, my tribulations and temptations, I shame myself almost to death, thinking, what are they in comparison to the sufferings of my beloved Savior, Jesus Christ? Suffering, indeed, in the perspective of his, is nothing for us. But even so, he abides with us in our times of difficulty and peril, if we but call upon him. And then we come to the end of our liturgy, one that is fraught with all that life offers, a blessing and a benediction. Jesus departs this life, one fraught with all that he could offer. Death is life's final benediction for him. It will be for us. For us, it marks the end of human disappointments and sufferings, as it marks the end of all that we have come to love about life. And even more, it is a blessing as benedictions purport to be upon God's people that we receive when we leave worship. Death's blessings for us is relief. It's release from the fragile, temporary, physical we call our body. No more disappointments, pains, or labors. Only earthly rest in an urn or a box buried in the ground or held on a shelf for later. So what do they do to Jesus? They hung him, broken and bleeding upon a cross for everyone to see. Here's your king. Come, behold your beloved. You did this to him, not we. Son of God indeed, see, oh see, how he bleeds and how he dies. This is the road the road paved with godly intentions. Mysterious as God's intentions might seem in such a tragic story, yet it unfolds. And we know that intention of God is good, not so much so for his son, but for you and for me. We know also that this road we call passion doesn't just end at a cross, or in a tomb that was closed up by a huge stone and sealed. The good news is that this is not the end of the story. To hear the rest of the story, I invite you to return and join us in joyful celebration on the next Sabbath day. Same time, same place, and it will be a much grander day than this. Amen. Our hymn is hymn number 759, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. I invite you to stand as you're able.
Let's pray. We pray to you, O Lord, Lord of palm branches and crosses, for you understand us, and in love you have promised not to push us away, any who would come to follow in your way. And so this day we pray. We pray for people who feel pushed away, pushed away from a living faith in Jesus by pressures from friends or family those who feel pushed away by other people in churches if they do not share the same ideals or ways or people who are pushed out by those who want power whose main love is to be noticed or to have control help us O lord to feel your welcome whenever we would call upon you lord in your mercy yeah. we pray for your church that all those who trust in Jesus will be made able by 
by your spirit to follow his humility, to see and imitate his servant life, to welcome and not condemn. Help your church to be like Jesus. We pray to you, Lord of palm branches and crosses, for you know the warm glow of being praised, the loneliness of being hated. You know our very feelings. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. We pray for world leaders who understand their role to serve the peoples of the world. That posturing, that, that posturing will be replaced by practical action to make a difference. And jockeying for position be replaced by genuine efforts to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, care for those who are weak. And we pray that you would hear the cries of their peoples who call for an end to the war in Ukraine, that they have courage to stand against tyranny, assist with aid the fight that this crime against humanity is perpetuated by Russia, bring your more perfect peace to this war town, to our nation, and this world. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray, O oh Lord, Lord of palm branches and crosses, to bring your healing for those whom we would intercede this day. For Raiden Black, a young a child who is in need of your assistance. For James, for Kenneth, for Nikki, for Tom, for Bill, for Sam and Becky and Sarah, for Evelyn, for Nancy, for each whom we remember in the silence of this moment that we commend to your care. Give to each the help and hope that is needed for living of this day and facing the unknowns of tomorrow. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for those who have recently lost those who may have loved in shock and confusion pain and sorrow, especially of the unexpected losses. We pray for hearts to be open to the comforting of your spirit, shown through friendship, through community, through your call to us in our time of need. We remember those known who mourn in these days, who need to be sure that you invite those in sorrow to turn to you, especially as we remember those whom we hold dear and precious in our hearts before you now. Help us to be a resurrection-filled people. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. And we ask, O oh God of grace, that you will make us more like some of the crowd, they who will follow Jesus, they who will give his praise, that we will turn away from wrong and evil and stand on the Lord's side, that we will be faithful in worshiping the one who has come in the Lord's name through our singing, our worship, our prayer, our attention, the giving of our skills, our time, and means through the days of our lives, and in the offering which we make. Bless, we pray, that all is given to your glory and the good of the many. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let all God's people say, Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you all. And I also with you. Greet those nearest to you or offer a sign of peace. Yeah. 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 This day we invite all who are baptized Christians who acknowledge the presence of Christ in bread and wine to share in our Lord's Supper as we make preparation for that now. Our communion will be uh, to come as you are ready to the communion rail when invited and uh, to receive the bread, wafer this day, and to hold that uh, till the cup passes that we might use in tension and uh, share in the communion and be dismissed. We turn to our liturgy and to our bulletin for the responses that are there. And I invite you to join me in our offering prayer. Holy God, grant
gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your holy creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the fires of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name. We join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. My friends, our Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took some bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup. And when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. All is prepared, come and share in his presence. I invite you to come forth from uh, this side where Will is, and uh, we'll just do this side of the table. The congregation on this side can come to this side. So just come and share in our Lord's presence.
can stand as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace, his mercy, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And together we pray. Loving Father of all, your only Son came as a servant and was obedient to all the ages that get on the cross. As he has served us here at this table, make us humble like him and bring us seed with him in his glory. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. With our closing hymn after the benediction and our announcements as regular. May Christ, our crucified Savior, draw you to himself so that you may find in him the assurance of sin's forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. Almighty God bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank God and praise God for a crowd today. <laughs> they feel so right. Thank you for being here and for helping us begin this journey of Holy Week. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a birthday today. I don't know if it's actually the day or not, but it well, is. It is. It's Evelyn's oh, birthday. Yeah. 85 years young and strong. Yeah. Five years today. Yes, indeed. Uh, happy birthday, and we'll sing that. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Anybody else have any uh, celebrations and joys to share after a rather not so uplifting sermon? Spring break is going to be all next week for our kids. Yay! <laughs> Teachers rejoice! <laughs> after this week, after Easter? Yeah, well, we yeah. actually have the Friday off. Oh, you do? Okay, so starting Good Friday. Yeah, and then the whole rest of the next week. Excellent, excellent. Um, one thing we try and do in this little community of faith is reach out to our community. Yesterday, we had two infants and five children at our egg hunt. We were in competition with uh, a big one down at the park, and we didn't realize that. But nonetheless, we had children here, and they had an abundance of fun, as I did with them. So we're thankful for all that volunteered to help with that. Now, our ministry and outreach continues on this Thursday. And if anyone can help, you can talk to uh, Donna and TAN about how we're preparing for that. But on Wet Thursday, we're delivering 80 lunches to Maryville Elementary School to give thanks to the teachers and the aides and the faculty there for their work and their commitment to the children of our community. So it's a simple little outreach, but something I hope will be a blessing for them. Uh, so they're gonna do preparation of those bag lunches on Wednesday sometime, and we'll deliver on that morning, on Thursday. Uh, Thursday evening, seven o'clock, Good um, on a Thursday, Good Friday at seven o'clock, Different messages than today, uh, so I hope you'll uh, come out and join us for one of those at least. And then we gather at 11 o'clock hour next Sunday for a, a celebration of Easter. Uh, any other things going on in people's lives? Deanne? If you would like an Easter lily yep. for next Sunday, I'm going to put a piece of paper out here, just sign and put what you're in honor or in memory of. Because we found some yesterday that we can go get. Okay. But we need to get them today because they might not be there tomorrow. They might not. And we got the grant for the summer. Yes. So um, Pastor Greg wrote it and sent it to the seminary and we are the seminary, sorry. And we got it for twenty five hundred dollars. We will be doing Wednesday night, um, either Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday night. We're hearing we're in competition in the morning time. Okay. But night time would be maybe better to Meals for the homeless and for the aged and for anyone that wants to join. Will some of those be delivered if we know of that as well? So it's an outreach to the community of Helping Feed. The Senate's helping us with fun, funds, but we'll need bodies that can help make that preparation. So we'll have a meeting at the end of May. Yep, end of May for planning that. Our little summer ministry. 
Foundation. So we are alive and well here in Georgetown, and we're thankful for each and every one of you. Uh, Pastor Blaine, welcome, and Donna is a faithful spouse. Pastor Blaine uh, has been a friend of mine for many a year from back in Delaware, Maryland. He's lived here at the beach for a good while. He did retire. Now, he's been here once, I think. I need somebody in May, at the end of May, but we'll talk later. But uh, thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, let's stand for our closing hymn. It is the first three verses of Go to Dark Gethsemane. Hymn number 347. Play it all the way through if you could, Will.